In this next hour, our panelists will share their insights on how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the adoption and use of telemedicine in healthcare and what place telemedicine may have in the healthcare journey beyond the pandemic. I'm excited to introduce our speakers and moderator for our panel today. Our speakers include Dr. Richard Boxer, um, who is a clinical professor of urology at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and the Chief Medical Officer of IANFAS. He is a national leader in healthcare and cannabis policies and also an international leader in telemedicine and helped create the telemedicine industry in the private sector at Teledoc 15 years ago. Matt Daly is Vice President of Home Dialysis Transformation and Care Model Innovation at Zavita Healthcare, which is working toward the industry transforming vision of one in four patients on home therapy. Prior to Davida, Matt worked as a management consultant for the Boston Consulting Group and led the U.S. market entry for a Latin America-based healthcare IT company. Chris O'Dell is a UCLA alum and the administrative director of digital health at Stanford Healthcare. He is responsible for the creation and execution of Stanford Healthcare's digital health strategy, and that has included their recent COVID digital response to expand healthcare for clinicians and patients. Katie Peterson is the Director of Operational Excellence at ABLE2, where she's focused on scaling the company's operations to support its mission of providing the highest quality behavioral health services. Prior to joining ABLE2, she was at ZocDoc for nearly a decade, working on improving access to care in commercial and operational leadership roles. This session will be moderated by John Tanaway. John coordinates telehealth for Kaiser Permanente Southern California and teaches telehealth at the Fielding School of Public Health at UCLA. He sees innovative technologies as a key to lowering costs and enhancing the healthcare experience for both patients and providers. Uh, John, before I turn it over to you in the panel, um, I will note that uh, if we have time, we'll, we'll try to turn to some audience <laughs> questions at the end. Um, so please feel free to go ahead and submit the questions in the Q&A function uh, on the bottom panel of your screen. Now I'll turn over to you, Jano. All right, thank you, Fionn. Yeah, as, as you mentioned, I've been at KP Southern Cal for about 15 years now. I've been working all on technology and telehealth, and this last year has been an interesting one. I've been as busy as I've ever been my whole time there. So, for example, pre-COVID, we would measure our video visit data in 0.1% increments, <laughs> and now it's completely changed. So the pandemic, of course, has changed everything in our lives. Um, and telehealth, of course, included in that. So let's just jump into our, our questions. We have a lot of great topics today. Let's start on how the pandemic has impacted and of how we use and think about telehealth. So the first question here is, prior to the pandemic, what do you think were the main barriers to providers and patients to adopting and utilizing telehealth? Um, Chris, we'll start with you. Thanks, John. Um, I, I I think there are two main barriers. One is uh, reimbursement. So as part of the COVID pandemic, we're all familiar with the public health emergency, which effectively allowed telehealth to be reimbursed at parity with in-person. And so many health systems and vendors and, and folks who were not paid for this prior to the pandemic were able to not only offer telemedicine, but they're able to offer it to every single insurance class. So for us, that's commercial gets the same care as Medicare gets the same care as Medi-Cal, and you're not worried about getting paid for it. Um, I think that's definitely the biggest barrier. But the second one for us is just having a singular organizational focus on this. Um, you, you said it well, John, which is prior to the pandemic, we talked about, you know, trying to hit one to two percent of our business being done virtually. And at the peak of the pandemic, we were doing 70 percent of all Stanford's business virtually. And having a, a singular focus on that goal, I think, is is uh, 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 one of the barriers that we did. You know, we did, certainly didn't have that prior to the pandemic. Thank you, Chris. How about you, Katie? 
Yeah, I would agree. Those are definitely the top two things I've come to mind, speaking from both the consumer standpoint here too. I would say from a, a patient standpoint, access was the, one of the main barriers as well. And I would break down access into two parts. So one is access because there just wasn't availability for telehealth appointments at this time. Again, if organizations are doing one to 2% of their appointments, there just wasn't that much inventory of those appointments out there. The second part, and I think this is still an issue today that I'm sure we'll get into in this conversation is what is the access point? There were some direct to consumer telehealth providers, but if you have a provider relationship, you're not certain if that organization actually allows telehealth appointments or doesn't. And so both of those just confusion and lack of access was definitely a really big barrier for patients. Um, and kind of similar to what Chris was saying with a singular focus, I'd also say for provider organizations, it was also just having the infrastructure available. And that's not just like having the actual technology solution, but having the change management built around that. And again, if you're doing one to 2%, you don't need to make that a focus. Um, and I think we've learned a lot, which we'll get into too, about how to actually mobilize and utilize and build out that infrastructure, but it wasn't there for the mass majority of organizations before. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Katie. Matt, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, John. So I, I, I'll share a bit of context. I think our context at the Vita is uh, just a little bit different. So we have dialysis patients and in, in my case, the home dialysis patients, about 30,000 patients that do their treatments at home. And uh, once or twice a month, they come into a clinic and they meet with their, their care team, which is a group of clinicians and, and their physician. Um, and so we have this longitudinal relationship over many, many months or years with those patients. Uh, and actually for us, reimbursement wasn't the issue. And so um, the, the issue was really much more about just hesitancy to change, right? And so I think for, for patients, there's this feeling of kind of comfort of when I go in person, I know I'm going to get the attention I need. I'll get my questions answered. I'll have the right kind of experience with my clinical team uh, and, and worry about what that experience will be like if it's virtual. Uh, I think for our clinicians and physicians, it was really about, can I really provide effective care, right? And so if I can't put my hands on the patient, I can't see them and talk to them in person, it's just not going to be nearly as effective. And so in our case, we actually, we had a telehealth platform that we developed. We, we knew that kind of the industry is shifting in its direction. We want to be ready for it. And fortunately, built one in 2019 <laughs> um, and uh, and was was quite fortunate. So when the pandemic broke out, we had really it was available and just very little interest among patients and clinicians. Uh, and then suddenly in March of last year, that, that exploded. And we went from just a, just a few hundred people that had interest to, to tens of thousands that now wanted to leverage it. Um, and, and, and I think what people found is like, hey, actually our physicians and clinicians found, hey, actually this works okay. I mean, we can actually do most of what we want to. We can have really quality, high quality, effective inter interactions with the patient. And I think patients also realize that this is, is a pretty convenient option. And so we've continued to see not that same level that we saw in the early days of the pandemic, but certainly many, many times more people that are continuing to leverage that going forward. All right, thank you, Matt. How about you, Rick? Well, the, the, in my mind, the single greatest uh, impediment to telemedicine preceding COVID was uh, imagination. Uh, the, no, no one could really get their arms around the idea and about having interaction with patients and giving quality of care. The thing that I uh, worked on in the government at the highest levels for, for years was trying to uh, improve quality access and affordable and convenient access. And so when I left uh, working in the government, I um, helped create the company Teladoc. And we, at the time, 15 years ago approximately, were a bankrupt, effectively bankrupt, and, had, and it was a small company in Dallas, which grew to now today, it's $40 billion. The, uh, and the reason principally is that people began to become aware, certainly after the COVID crisis and pandemic. It went from, in, in January of 2020, there was approximately 0.1% of people um, in the Medicare population that were interested in telemedicine, and it went to 43% by April. So it's 4,300 inc times increase. Just, you know, astounding. However, uh, the, it'll also come down to earth, and that is that P technology is is changing at light speed. It's evolving uh, constantly and very quickly at the speed of discovery. However, people are not evolving that quickly. P 
people are social animals. They want to have that personal interaction. And so they will are likely and already starting to return to the doctor's office uh, so that they can have that personal interaction. My father was a general practitioner, uh, GP, and now called, of course, family doctors, but uh, GP in the 50s and 60s. And he said that that 70% of his patients just wanted to have a conversation because no one was talking to them. And of course, we learned in medical school that 80% of, of diagnosis is done by history, which can be done on telephone or on video. So there's a tremendous amount of, of, um, of importance and interest in giving affordable cat access to quality care virtually. Uh, but there will be a coming, um, coming down to earth as far as the numbers when as people want to have that social interaction that they crave. The other one other word that that um, as was preventing telemedicine from becoming extraordinarily um, um, popular prior to COVID, and that's money. And that was mentioned earlier as far as parity. But even with uh, parity, the doctors' offices were um, doctors were encouraging patients to come in, not just because of the interaction and the consultation, which could could possibly be done on the um, you know on virtually. But it's the the lab, the chest X-rays, the you know various things that are also um, uh, money makers for the in the doctor's office that would not be able to be available. So there was certainly um, the economics as well as the lack of imagination. Yeah, John, if I if I can play for something that uh, Rick just mentioned, I, I actually <clears throat> it is a good point of people are already starting to return to the office. In fact, we saw the same thing, right? We've seen that you had this huge spike in kind of March, April timing of patients that didn't want to be in a, in an office. And then they started to come back. And so, you know, one of our early observations is um, in our case, it's actually an application on the phone that the patient has, and that's how they engage with telehealth services. And if you're, if you're only using that app for a monthly telehealth visit or even less frequently, right, you're just missing a huge opportunity up here. Right. And so this is some of that, I guess the imagination piece. I mean, there, you've now got a channel directly to a patient who you normally only see at best a couple times a month. And here's an opportunity to deliver a lot of value-added services, care supports. And so if you can leverage that channel and take advantage of this moment that we have now where you can reach them directly, bring things that they feel like are valuable in their care, um, there's really a lot of transformational things you can do in, in patient outcomes and kind of the connections that patients have to use a provider as well. And, and companies, <coughs> uh, startup, <coughs> pardon me, startup companies have, have, have used it to their advantage. Uh, there's a company that is using care management um, on those using those applications, now the patients are um, are used to using virtual care. What they're doing is they're using that application instead of for the doctor's visit. Let's just say um, every three to six months, they're 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 using the application to contact them once a month, and they also created a method by which doctors will gain financially by that because all, that the nurses will interact with the patient on a monthly basis but send the information to the doctor, he or she will sign off, and then it becomes a, um, a, a virtual visit. Yeah, and I think, right, I think there's, there's an opportunity here, right? If you, can, if you can show patients that there's value in virtual care beyond just you know, the telehealth video visit, right? And you can kind of engage them now in this moment, I think this can be a, a really a pivot point in the industry and in how we deliver care. Um, if, if we don't and we are limited in how we think about telehealth and just to get us through this emergency, and I, I think that much of our consumer and even provider behavior is going to start to go back to the way that we used to do things. We'll talk about this in a few minutes, I'm sure, and, we're, and you and I, Matt and I, are, are, are taking over it a little bit, but, but um, the, the virtual visit is just the very, very floor of what's going to happen. Sky's the limit with applications, with, with, um, with monitoring and uh, with wearables, and we'll, we'll talk about that. But it is what we're seeing right now is is nothing compared to what it's going to be. Exactly right. Yeah, that was a great start to our our topics here. This is definitely just the beginning. <clears throat> um, Chris, you mentioned how you saw your ratios flip. I, we saw it similarly at KP in Southern Cal, where we were doing fifteen percent phone visits and eighty five percent in person, and then immediately, in, you know, in March, we flipped that where it's eighty five percent phone and then incrementally putting in some video. Um, what did we learn from this mass adoption in telemedicine during the pandemic? Anyone want to start? 
And what are some learnings that we can apply I'll, and take forward? I, I'll go with a few things that I think we learned. One is that um, when you're when you're building these types of digital health technologies, you need to build for scale. So it wasn't something where you got to kind of walk into it. Week one in March, we had uh, 1,900 providers trained. We have 2,200 providers roughly at Stanford. 1,900 of those were trained in doing visits. Um, since the pandemic, 250,000 patients had their first video visit at Stanford. And so if your system's not built for scale, it peters out pretty quickly. Um, and, and I guess the second thing that we learned from that is this concept that you, you have to meet consumers where they are. As consumers tried to figure their way out into the system, we let them use, it didn't always have to be the video visit through our patient portal and through our EMR. We let them use Zoom, we let them use WebEx. And, and at one point, about 9% of all of our visits were being done outside of our kind of sanctioned video visit platform. And so I, I think that those are two big aspects that we learned. And I guess the, uh, the third gets a little bit to what uh, uh, Dr. Boxer was saying, which is um, we had to figure out a way to determine when it was clinically appropriate to do virtual versus in-person because patients really don't know that. So we actually have, have not experienced any drop off from a volume perspective since March. Um, we're still doing about 60,000 visits a month virtually even as our clinic visits have climbed back up. Um, so it represents a smaller percentage, but volumes are still the same. And I think in large part, that's because we've been laser focused on telling patients when it makes sense to do virtual and when it makes sense to come back to the uh, clinic. So behavioral health and sleep remain about 100% virtual. Um, orthopedics is very little virtual care being delivered anymore. And that's a good thing. Coming from a behavioral health space, I'm really bad from what you just said, Chris, which is meeting the patient where they are. That is exactly precisely what it is. And I think that's been the biggest kind of mass learning from this is, and I think the other way to phrase it too, is moving away from healthcare to health. And this is also gets into, as we now talk about social determinants of health, I think telehealth is a great foray into in just a completely paradigm shift of focusing on the patient, focusing on the their need and meeting there. So I do think that all of this change has, has changed that across the industry, regardless of your patient, the provider, company, et cetera. Um, the other thing I would say it changes kind of more on a micro level, but it's just communication and, and that gets into trust between the patient and provider relationship as well. We found that um, through lots of surveys that well, Dr. had done previously, and then also I'm sure Kaiser has done these as well, that most patients had done their first telehealth visit. I think 80% of them were return. And then I think a recent study that Accenture just put out said 60% of patients actually trust their providers more as a result of doing these telehealth appointments. And so I think that that part of what we've also seen is both offering it, but also the communication about offering and the communication between the patient and provider. We've just expanded that scope so significantly and making sure that we are focusing on all of the communication points between a patient and a provider is really important um, to continue with this momentum, but then also to continue to build trust that we can continue with the quality of care. How about Rick or Matt, anything you'd like to add? <laughs> Yeah, I'll make, I'll make one comment. I mean, I think similar to what I said before. I mean, I think we we realize that if you're if you're just using telehealth as a way to replace the in person visit and that's it, uh, there's there's some value there for the patient and for the and for the physician as well. But it just isn't. You're missing an opportunity, right? And so there's if you if you have this channel now and you leverage that to have more points of connection and points of connection that happen in our case throughout the course of the month, um, there's actually a lot of kind of value added services and supports you can deliver to patients um, via that same channel. So again, just really kind of expand the vision beyond just pure telehealth video visits into a lot more of a virtual care ecosystem. Okay, anything? Pretty well covered it. <laughs> Okay. Yes, I think so too. <clears throat> yeah, so along these lines, you know, how do we align incentives to promote telehealth? I mean, we know that it's not going to continue at this rate and people may go kind of back to uh, what they were used to. How do we continue this progress and how do we align for the providers, patients, insurers so that we can continue on this path? Well, I'll, I'll start. There's, there's no question in my mind that 
that um, <clears throat> that it will we will never return to the level that we had in January 2020. Uh, there, it all all these things tend to seek their own level, uh, like water or others that other um, increases in in business that that go on because of a particular crisis and uh, people start thinking, oh, well, I have to do one thing or another based on a crisis, but then they go back to their normal, their normal behavior. Uh, having said that though, that because of what I spoke about very briefly earlier with wearables and, and, and monitoring, uh, there'll be an enormous number of opportunities that will shape the reasons why people will start using the uh, virtual care in a, in a much more rigorous way. Doctors also will, uh, will be interested in, in keeping in touch with patients because fundamentally a telemedicine uh, platform is a referral engine. And that is for health systems or for that matter, doctors uh, individually, but usually in groups, they will, let's say, keep in touch and make, make be sticky with their patients so that perhaps it'll be a, a cough um, or a twisted ankle one day and a, and a total hip the next day. I mean, it, it, it's in many respects, it's, it becomes a method by which you can expand your practice and a good cause good care, but then bring the patient in when it's, um, uh, when it's more uh, financially renew remote, financially better. <laughs> and, uh, and so there's, there's all sorts of things that are driving telemedicine from the practicality and the, and the convenience and the quality of care that, that can be reached to the 100 million Americans that are in rural America um, and simultaneously be able to um, improve the urban care by virtue of having that, that interaction, that stickiness and, and being able to have the patient within the system. I'll actually, I, I think that's, I want to follow up on something you said, which is the, this idea of telemedicine as a referral engine. I, I think that that is, that's a very, um, it's a scary thing as well as it is a lot of potential. It's scary to me when telemedicine is used as what I like to call diversionary telemedicine, when a health plan uses it to say, you know, basically they're using it as utilization management. They're saying you can use telemedicine, but only when it's through your health insurer and we're going to let you go to anywhere that we refer you out to. I, that, that type of telemedicine worries me. And from a reimbursement perspective, it's actually the easiest to pay for because the plan is at risk. And so they pay for it. Um, when telemedicine is used as a virtual triage to get you into an appropriate setting of care or to create access, I think there's a lot of potential there. And that's a really good thing. Unfortunately, it's not a telemedicine problem, but our healthcare system is not very well set up to pay for that. So, it, you know, we have this incentives gap where if you look at Medicare Advantage or somewhere where you're the at-risk entity, they're happy to pay for telemedicine. Or John, you at Kaiser, you guys have always paid for telemedicine because you're just shifting money from one pocket to the other. Um, it's, when you, it's when you begin to have to pay someone for something that doesn't yield immediate value that our system doesn't work very well. So if, if you have to pay Stanford to do a telemedicine visit and that avoids downstream utilization or makes you healthier five years from now, no one knows how to realize that value and no one's willing to pay for that proactively. So that's a big problem, I think. And, and you know, I think that Dr. Boxer hit on that right, the nail right on the head, which is if telemedicine is a referral channel, you're going to see it. The, the light is cast right on it. Is it utilization management or does it create access? All right, great, great discussion there. So let's talk about more about the whole telemedicine experience. Um, so how's the adoption of telemedicine changed for experience of the healthcare providers, for the patients, uh, for the healthcare professionals? Um, just looking at this, you know, forum here, you know, we are gathered across from New York, Denver, California. It's made it a lot easier for this group to get together. I'm sure a lot of our attendees are coming from different locations as well. Um, so how have you seen a changing for the healthcare providers and patients and professionals. Well, I'll, I'll start again. Oh, I'll go ahead. No, yeah, no, you, please, please. I, I was going to say that, uh, that one of the things that I, I did as the chief medical officer of Teladoc was constantly um, looking at 
how the patients reacted to the to the experience. And we had quite a remarkable um, method of, of getting to our patients afterwards and in, the, in surveying them. And so the the we found that ninety five percent of of all patient interactions uh, were met with um, satisfaction and and uh, were said and the patients said that they never went to another healthcare um, facility based on the care that they got from the t from the teledoc physician. So it wasn't an additive; it was an instead of, and it and it uh, was able to demonstrate the patients really appreciate, we had like 95% satisfaction rate and you can't get 95% satisfaction rate in the United States on anything. And so th this was particularly um, um, well, you know, well received by, by patients. And, and as far as physicians are concerned, uh, they, they, were, they were very pleased with the results as well because they were expanding their practice. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, no, thanks. I mean, I think, I think what's, what's interesting about 2020 is um, we on the business side were going through something very similar when it came to telehealth, right? And so I, I have not worked out of an office in almost a year now. It, March, I think March 13th was the last day that I worked out of my office in, in downtown Denver. Um, and, and I think there was a lot of hesitation, right? I mean, if you, if you talked to a lot of us in you know, 2019 about having teammates that were all working virtually, there was a lot of resistance to that, right? There was this sense of, you know, you're not going to be as effective. You're not going to have a strong community. Those interactions aren't going to be as meaningful and just a lot of, of hesitation. And what we were kind of forced to learn because of the pandemic is that, no, actually it works okay. Like we've actually done all right. In fact, not, not only has the work continued and we continue to be effective, but in some ways our effectiveness has been even increased. Um, and we found that there's a lot of efficiency that we can capture in our day as well, because we're not commuting and, and, you know, and other things that just tend to make our days less efficient when you're, when you're heading into an office. And so I think that what's interesting is, right, we're experiencing that at the same time our clinicians were who had similar reservations, right? You said, hey, it's not gonna be quite as effective. I'm not gonna be able to accomplish the same things via a, a video visit as I can in person. Um, and it's gonna mess my day up because you know I've, I'm used to having people kind of just come through in the office and now I gotta be switching back and forth and it's just gonna, just gonna create a lot of inefficiency for me. And, and, and they were forced to start using it by a pandemic and realize just like we did who have been working from home that it, actually it works okay. I mean, you can, you can accomplish still much of what you need to, uh, the visit can still be really effective. Uh, and in fact, you can capture new efficiencies in your schedule that you weren't able to before. And so I think that's been a big, a big learning for patients and for clinicians and, and why I, part of the reason why I think telehealth is gonna continue even post pandemic. I think it also, I think it has become, um, there's this question of like what, and I think we'll probably speak about this at some point too. I think it is for patients, it's become, this is a norm. Like I'm, I require us to have access to telehealth in some space. And you primarily see that in the behavioral health, mental health space, and also the primary care space. And I'd also say, Rick mentioned this earlier with the Medicare population. I think that there was a big open question prior to the pandemic about the elderly population actually accessing telehealth as well, but you've seen a, a huge increase in engagement there. And you're seeing again, it is a norm and it is possible for the entire patient population. Um, so I think that piece from a patient side is, is it's becoming a norm. The other piece too is a quality of care. Um, I think there's a big question around, can you still have the same level of quality of care through telehealth platforms? And once again, we've seen that the quality of care has not slipped. And again, it's mainly in preventative care space, behavioral health care space, and in many ways is actually improved because you just have more access. Like the points you were talking about, Matt was talking about previously with just messaging with doctors. Again, it's everything around the healthcare and the acute need that also helps drive positive outcomes. And we just expanded the scope of that so much too. And I think we touched upon this, but how do you see telemedicine fitting into the overall healthcare experience? Balancing telehealth versus in-person visits. I mean, we've seen the ratio flipped. Uh, where do you see it being the right balance and how it all fits in? Um, we, we, uh, there's two types. I, there's two ways to think about that. I think there are aspects of telemedicine that where, where parts of, um, business will go fully virtual. So as I mentioned, sleep medicine or psychiatry, I think those businesses are, are actually low acuity, urgent care. We're already seeing a lot of aspects of those businesses be fully virtual. And, and that's, that's, I, I think that 
that's a good thing. But the one that is perhaps not as clear is the aspect of omni-channel where you kind of marry the telemedicine into the in-person so that you have an in-person visit, but that your continuity of care and your follow-up visits are done through telemedicine or that maybe your pre-visits are done through telemedicine. I think you'll see a lot more of that and that'll probably permeate all aspects of, of specialty care and, and, and a lot of other places that can't go fully digital. Um, I will say that in my mind, the way you achieve success on either of them really is helping the consumer or patient understand how and when to access it. Most of our telemedicine today, we proactively reach out and say, you know, would you like to schedule this through telemedicine? No one really knows if I have a behavioral health need or pink eye or something more serious. Is that a good instance to do telemedicine? Um, and in that sense, there's a lot of kind of uh, meeting the patient again, such that they know how and when to use which one. Well, I've always been um, impressed with how actually smart the the consumer is uh, relative to telemedicine. No one is no one contacts um, the, the telemedicine services and says, "Listen, I got this lacerated arm. What, you know, can you help me?" Um, they choose. They pretty well choose what they think will be the best care for themselves, and they understand that they can be treated for an upper respiratory infection or a or you know, um, urinary infection, or commonly you know different infections. And in fact, th that's one of the most common things that that happens in telemedicine is prescription of antibiotics for a particular malady, one or the other. Uh, and so the patients are pretty you know pretty well triaged themselves. But the, but the doctors are trained. Certainly the um, the doctors and companies like Teladoc are trained that there is a certain scope of care that, that is uh, manageable by, by telemedicine. And we found actually that, that some, something like um, three to 5% of all patients who called were, um, were sent off, well, 1% were sent off to an emergency room. And 2% um, were, were end up being dissatisfied because they wouldn't receive opioids. Uh, and there, so it's really pretty common that, in fact, overwhelmingly common that patients choose the right kind of service. But if not, then they're, then they're told what to do and they're better, you know, that, that, that telemedicine is not particularly good for this, for their particular situation. I think there's an element of like of speed to access that actually is important here too, right? And so just putting myself in the shoes of a healthcare consumer, right? Uh, which I am, right? I mean, I, for me on a personal, right? If I say, hey, I could try and get an appointment for an in-person appointment or try telehealth. There's this concern that lingers that I'm going to do a telehealth visit and they're just going to tell me that I have to come in, into the office. And so if I try and schedule a telehealth appointment and it's two days out, right, my, my risk of, yeah, I'm going to wait two days. I'm going to have this visit. I'm going to feel super frustrated because they told me I had to come in person and I got to wait two more days now to get into an office. You know, I'm just going to lower my risk and just schedule an in-person visit now. And so if you can give me very quick access to the telehealth appointment and I can get that in two hours, um, then you've taken away that risk that I feel and, and much easier for me to feel confident I can access that. And even if it's just a triage function that gets me somewhere else, I haven't really lost anything in that process. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other thing I'd add to this, like, and where does it fit within the landscape? I think one is like, we'll continue to see success and growth in the areas that we know are trying to ensure and work. And so that is, again, preventative care spaces, those urgent care spaces, behavioral health spaces. And um, I think we'll continue to see growth there. And also longitudinal, so Matt, especially as you were talking about longitudinal care with various disorders, I think there's, there's a lot of success there. Um, I think the second area of where this fits, and I think what the next year to two years, et cetera, will look like, and Chris spoke about this a bit too, is how do we transition into a hybrid approach? And what does that look like based on specialties, based off the organization of having, whether it's an access point or the actual care delivered to, uh, virtually, and then what needs to be in person? And then say in the third place that there's a big open question of how this fits in the industry is all the connection points. And so that's the remote patient monitoring, that's the messaging with providers as well. And this gets into one of the big issues we all experience with interoperability and communication between systems and different groups um, that will be exacerbated uh, now that we have all these different platforms. And I think it's all of those connections will be an interesting thing to see how we can continue to scale um, ability to access this. 
You're exactly right. I mean, we have a lot of options these days. So how do you see, for example, retail telehealth is what I like to call it. Um, patients, you know, they have their health plan and they have options like teledoc or zipnosis or hims and hers and all these other, you know, non-plan options that they can go to. How do you see that fitting in? Because we see new telehealth companies popping up almost every day, every week, and a lot of, you know, investing, investment firms, you know, like SPACs, mergers, targeting them. So they've become really popular. Any thoughts on that? I, I think that you, well, I'll just say you heard my worry, which is that when these companies partner with health plans, that if they're doing so in a way that creates diversionary telemedicine, that is a worry for me. But I actually think there's a win-win as well, which is that um, there, some of these companies are really convenient. They're giving consumers exactly what they want. I don't think anyone expected that Viagra and Propecia was going to be such a big market that Hims and Hers has made it. And, and actually, Hims and Hers and the deal that they did with Oshner recently is evidence that there is a win-win, that you can provide really convenient retail telemedicine and kind of create what Katie just described, which is instead of that, then having this digital cliff that happens where you say, sorry, you've maxed out your digital services. We don't really offer anything more than that. They're creating a warm handoff into Oshner so that if you need more, Oshner's there and vice versa. Oshner can send something back to him and hers and say, this is cheaper and easier for you to get here. And I think that win-win is actually pretty interesting. How can we bridge the gap between the in-person experience and telehealth? So we've talked about, I mean, some of it is just perceived gap, right? Patients may expect that the in-person experience may be higher quality, um, but telehealth, as we've talked about, can be just as high. How do we bridge the gap, um, whether it's real or, or not, or just perceived? Well, people- I think the people... in-person experience is, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. <laughs> What was that, Chris? I missed that. I was just going to say the inpatient experience is already so bad that, that you, 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 we might as well bridge the gap for both of them. I don't think anyone's having a particularly easy time navigating the healthcare system in person. So there's, a, you know, let's just make it better than that. I, I, I was, you know, joking a little bit, but I think there's a lot of truth to that. Right, go ahead. Were you going to say something? <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I, I, what Chris said is absolutely true. Um, that is, when you compare um, something to something that is already not well received, uh, it's you know the hurdle is not too high. Uh, but the there's there's different levels of in, of interaction. That is the the warmest is person to person, same room, and then the and then after that it becomes a video like we're doing right now, and then it becomes telephonic. The coldest is is chat, basically, and uh, and some companies are actually doing that with uh, artificial intelligence that are using chat to to be more efficient. But what it be, once it goes back to the first thing I said, which is people being social animals, they really want to have some kind of warm interaction. Uh, and although you know, certainly the pandemic has has uh, caused people to make different choices. I think that we're going to continue to see a lot of telemedicine in just a matter of, of, um, of percentages. Uh, so telemedicine is going to be around forever at this point. Although you have to, you know, you think about uh, 150 years ago, uh, Alexander Graham Bell came up with this, this device. And the first house call was, he said, Dr. Watson, come in here. And the, uh, and really, Fundamentally, things have not changed in 150 years. You still have a telephone, you still have a doctor, and you still have the patient. Uh, but as time has gone on uh, with video, for example, uh, and applications, of course, that's changing everything. Uh, it'll continue to mature, that's for sure. Yeah, I think, there's, I think there's an aspect of personalization that actually helps quite a bit, and technology can actually help you do that. And so I think one of the, one of the fears is, I, you know, I try and use telemedicine. I've got to explain everything about my, my medical history because the person doesn't know me in the same way that if I went into an office, I might have that more personal connection with someone that maybe has seen me before. Um, and so I think if you can, 
uh, create an experience where the patient calls in and you say, Hey, yeah, you know, Mr. Daly, great. I can see that last time you contacted us was on this date and you had this issue and, and, and show proactively that you understand something about that patient's health history and even take it a step further to personalization, right? Especially in, in our context where we have this longitudinal relationship because this is a, a for someone with a chronic condition, you can say, Hey, Mr. Daly, I, Hey, you know, there's a reminder on there that says, Hey, I, I noticed that you're, you know, you had a grandson that was born. I remember you were talking about that last time that you were really excited about your, your grandson. You t- tell me more about that. Did that happen yet? Like again, ways to, to make that feel like a personal interaction. I think you can actually get people to feel a lot more excited and feel like they're still getting the, the value they want out of those, those interactions virtually. Well, that's a segue into the future of telemedicine uh, because, um, and maybe John, you're going to jump into that, but the future of telemedicine, I think is going to be, not the one-off doctors, but the health systems that, that really understand the patient. The more, the more information a, a doctor has when you are in a longitudinal experience, the better the quality of care is because the doctor really understands. But the more information you have as a telemedicine one-off is increases your responsibility and liability. And because one of the doc, one thing a doctor, the telemedicine doctor on a one-off basis doesn't want is to start trying to figure out your entire medical history. So if a person has is um, 25 years old and has a cough, it's going to be an upper respiratory infection. If a 70-year-old call, calls and has a cough, then there's a lot of, of um, possibilities. And the more information that doctor has, the more responsibility the doctor has. That's why I think that the health systems, as they have been growing like crazy in the telehealth, like Stanford and, and uh Cleveland Clinic and on and on and on. Every 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 health system, even in small hospitals, uh, are um, getting into telemedicine for lots of good reasons. But as for, as applies to patient care, I think that it's beneficial. Yeah. So let's talk more about the future. So what areas of healthcare or which groups of patients do you see um, telemedicine being able to make the most impact? I think the I'm often. Oh, good. I was going to say, the, I think the paces are very clear. Those that there was lack of access before, but actually quite a bit of, of care being offered. And so I think, and that's mainly mental health, behavioral health, and also preventative care and primary care. And I think those to Rick's point earlier too, that is really how we see the most high quality outcomes. And when, when you focus on mental health and you focus on preventative care. And so it's a good thing that that is where I think the, those types of patients, that type of care will be where we'll see the most adaption and the most increase. Um, go ahead, Chris. I, I was actually going to say, I, I think that telemedicine lays a really strong foundation that you can then apply automation and decision support on top of. So um, every time you're trading this type of synchronous communication, if you're able to store it and automate on top of it, I think that there's a whole world there that we haven't even broken into. So there's a Stanford physician named uh, Dr. Justin Coe. He's a dermatologist. And he applied a deep neural network to uh, images that were going back and forth uh, through telemedicine and proved that a AI algorithm is better at diagnosing melanoma than a dermatologist. Now, today, that's not worth that much because it can only look for melanoma. So it's not melanoma. It just says, oh, it's not melanoma. So it's not very helpful for diagnosis but it's an incredible decision support tool for a dermatologist who might otherwise miss melanoma. And so I expect that in five years, there's just a lot more of that that has been layered on top of what today we're calling telemedicine. One of the, uh, one of the, one of the things is I think um, doctors and healthcare providers uh, of all stripes um, almost uh, kind of, kind of like encourage me is that IBM Watson is going out, doctors are going in. <laughs> you know, they, they, computers can't quite figure out how to make a diagnosis or to standardize or at least direct treatment. It's amazing what, what uh, healthcare providers go through in order to focus on the correct diagnosis and treatment. So um, apps and you know, virtual care are going to be extraordinary and and wearables are going to be extremely important for the healthcare uh, provider to help the patient.
but it's not going to be replaced by AI, not in the near future. All right. Yeah, and, and John, I was just going to ask, the chronic population too, I think that's an important population that benefits, right? And so you've got, and this this is where you go beyond just the, the telehealth visit into, you know, how do I stay much more plugged in with you on a regular basis, help you with adherence to the care plan that's been established, help with some of the remote monitoring things that we've talked about today, um, and, and, and help you to achieve better outcomes in your care where I'm, you know, again, over a long period of time trying to work on things like behavior change. Right. So what are some remaining challenges uh, that we need to overcome for telemedicine to become a sustainable component of our healthcare delivery? Mm-hmm. Katie, we can start with you. Yeah, as I, not to go back to what we said previously, mm-hmm. but I think the, the two biggest challenges are what we started this conversation with, which is one, and they're related, one is just reimbursement and incentives and making sure that the policy and incentives actually align. And I think we'll continue to see, and John, to your earlier question too about kind of retail health, I think retail health and consumers going directly to healthcare providers is a way to push the industry forward and to push policy. And so I think that will continue to push it, but that needs to happen in order for it to expand. All right. One of the challenges in telehealth is just making sure that we have equitable access. So how do we address, you know, and what do industry leaders need to do to make sure that we have equitable access across different socioeconomic groups or different races? And... I think uh, John, there's a, there's a... That's very good. Go ahead, Chris. Um, well, I'll, I'll just, I'll also, Wen Lee from the chat has a good comment on this and um, as well, but I think that in my mind, you have to understand the gaps to begin with, to begin to make a, a, an impact, you know, equitable delivery. It's really hard to say in healthcare yet, if digital health or telemedicine exacerbates or makes those divides better. I, I really don't think anyone knows the answer, but we can start by seeing where the gaps are. So, at Stanford, we've just measured, um, do Medi-Cal patients, for example, use more virtual care than commercially insured patients? They actually don't. They tend to come more commonly in person. I don't know if that's a, because of clinical need, because of preference, or because of a problem with equity. Uh, um, but at least we're beginning to understand that that's a gap that we have that we can address. Um, and, and I'll parlay that into a little bit of Wenley's question, which is some there's a perception that, you know, that some underserved populations don't have phones or ability to get to this type of delivery. And and I would only say, I think there's some important national things to do, like broadband access, you know, providing fast, ubiquitous internet across the U.S. is a good way to get at this. But I actually don't think that that perception that patients don't have smart devices is as true as I once thought it was. We, we, we find that most patients not only have a, some device, but they're actually very comfortable with their own device. So when we hand them an iPad or something, they're very uncomfortable with that iPad. They don't understand the interface, but they really do understand the interface of their own device. So the more you can push this type of care into a distributed mode, you know, that, that kind of suits a bring your own device movement, I think that's a good way to bridge equity gaps in, in, in my mind. One of the things I did when I was um, working uh, to try, try to figure out affordable access to quality care before telemedicine is I, I was I decided to become a medical director in a federally qualified health clinic, basically the community clinics, uh, and uh, and to get to understand why patients do what they do, at least in, in a uh, segment of the population that is really served, and it it also ultimately struck me that I was more more amazed that they had they got any care rather than they didn't get some care. And that is because their lives are such, have a lot of chaos within them. Uh, but as, <clears throat> and I, but I think it ultimately becomes a, a, a matter of education, jumping off of that, but to going into telemedicine, uh, a matter of education. I think that the, the uh, like so many th- other things in older populations, it takes, uh, a while before they, they become familiar with it, or maybe they never will become familiar with it. Uh, but the younger population, uh, of course, eventually um, outlive the older population, and they, and they become used to the technology. So 
I think springing, springing, so to speak, uh, new kinds of technologies on the patients that they are unfamiliar with, whether it's language or it's technology, it's education, it's socioeconomic situation, is a, is a bridge too far for them. And, and so uh, these patients commonly will seek out their personal interaction because it, in their mind, and, and it's not wrong, but in their mind, they, they think that they're getting short shrifted by having to be forced into telemedicine when they really want to just see a doctor. So it, it's, it's education, I think, that will ultimately prove that, that all populations will be more familiar with, with telemedicine and virtual care. Yeah, and I think, that, I mean, there's certainly some really <laughs> tough issues here that we've got to solve. I think there's, there's one... There's one aspect that I think actually virtual care provides an opportunity. And so, again, I'm, I'm speaking more from the context of a chronic care population we're taking care of. But one of the things that we've struggled with historically is um, is uh, immigrant populations that, that speak a language other than English. And so, um, right, we, we have, you know, with Spanish speakers, right, there tends to be enough concentration that you might have someone locally that speaks Spanish and can really engage with them and give kind of that more personalized care, the sense of community, and some of those other things that are really valuable, but you get into other languages and that's really tough, right? So like you might, you might be the only patient that speaks Hmong in that clinic and there's no one there that's a clinician. And so you use translators or you, you know, bring in a family member to try and play that role uh, and you can deliver the care, but then there's no sense of community that you're able to form. And so uh, again, some real challenges. And, and as you go to more of a virtual model, that is much easier to address some of those kinds of issues, right? And so it, to, for us to you know, translate some of the educational things or support materials within an app environment, way easier to do that because now there's a scale at which you can deliver that across the country. Um, or even forming things like you know, virtual support groups or, uh, or virtual um, kind of care management programs. Again, if I can look at a national catchment area and bring together all my Hmong speakers across the whole country, there are some things that I can do to really support that population that are just very different when it is one person in a clinic in you know, Alabama. So, so again, I think it doesn't solve everything, still a lot of tough issues, but there are some opportunities that it really creates. And it also brings up, it also brings up, excuse me for interrupting, but it also brings up the need for cross-state licensing for, for um, the consortia that have been developed <clears throat> for telemedicine has been, has been important, particularly in this pandemic. But uh, cross-state cross, cross state, uh, licensing will solve a lot of problems so that, that let's just say, uh, someone speaks different languages in Alabama, but not in, in Colorado, whatever you were just mentioning, you can just quickly hook up the person to the, um, to the Alabama doctor. Yeah. Yep. I also think it's important to have this, the competency to be able to actually look at the population that you serve. So whether that's a pair and the, the patients that you cover or whether that's the actual system and looking at your population, having that competency to understand so that then you can design around the patient is really important. And I think again, the pandemic has taught us that. And then on a tactical level too, I think modalities, and this gets into the previous question, modalities really matter and making sure you have enough modalities to be able to get the general population. And so landlines work for phone calls and work for therapy and let's utilize landlines. I think we often think about it as just a smartphone and smartphones work too, but it's computers with smartphones. So making sure that you design and then have multiple modalities based off of that. Oh, you know, we're, we're running out of time, but I just want to say to those people who are out there and listening to us who are entrepreneurs, I'm certainly an entrepreneur um, in addition to being a physician, but and that just there's the opportunities within telehealth are spectacular. Now, although it, it seems like potentially, oh my goodness, we've got a mature industry, not even close. And so for all those um, smart people out there you know, uh, that are listening uh, or watching or both, uh, you know, the opportunities are, are almost endless. And so I encourage people to get involved in telemedicine uh, to, to really change the way healthcare is delivered. Because in the last, you know, since, since uh, we helped, I helped start Teledoc 15 years ago or so, um, when nobody uh, appreciated uh, or wanted it. And I've got all the welts and the scars to prove it at going in front of medical uh, regulatory agencies. And we um, ultimately, it proved to be a very effective way of treating people. And so uh, I, I just encourage people to get involved. I want to take a question from the audience. There's a couple of folks who are interested in this patient confidentiality and data protection. What are the steps that are t being taken to make sure that our data is protected? 
Um, I'll, I'll take that one really quick. So I, I would say that there's a, um, there's this perception that maybe telemedicine has a greater risk for fraud than other aspects of the business, which I really don't think is true. Um, I, I think that healthcare is very highly regulated business. The, the degree to which your medical records are protected within a health system actually hinders the progress and innovation much more than it ever, uh, you know, is, is a risk. So what I would say is I, I think that health systems have no incentive to make any of this data public. They protect it really well. And, and I would love to use that as an opportunity to say, I think there is just as much fraud in person as there is through telemedicine. And actually in some ways, fraud can be easier, more easily caught in a digital world than it is in an in-person world. And, and so um, I'll, I'll use my, my soapbox to say, I really don't believe there's an issue of fraud in related to telemedicine outsized compared to the rest of the business. And that your medical records are really well protected. We spent billions of dollars to make sure that happened. Yeah, I did just clarify what Chris said. I, I agree with what your, your statements and, and uh, HIPAA applies just as much to the digital interactions as it does to in person. And so, uh, you know, during, during the pandemic, there was, uh, there were some waivers given to be able to use non-HIPAA compliant platforms. And just because it was an emergency and many providers had to stand things up very quickly and, and just many weren't prepared for that. Um, uh, that, that said, I mean, that, that isn't going to continue forever. And, you know, many of the more sophisticated organizations, I mean, they already had a HIPAA compliant platform that will be the norm going forward. And so there are, are really strong protections that are built in there. There's a lot more money to be made in, in, um, in, insurance fraud than just looking at what people go, you know, going on in telemedicine. And that's where, you know, if you want to use the uh, Jerry Maguire um, or, you know, or the, or a bank robber, uh, go where the money is at. You know, that's where the money's at. Go to insurance fraud. That's, that's where the real profit is. Um, now, one of the things that, that I think is important is that telemedicine can actually offer a higher level of quality because uh, you will never see or almost never see in doctor's offices someone actually going over the records to see whether or not it, the care has been taken care of, been done appropriately. Whereas in telemedicine companies, or at least the ones that I've been involved with, we would review one out of every 10 records randomly to see if the quality care was, was done. And it's easy to do because it's all, it's all electronic, it's all virtual, it's all, um, it's, it's uh, you know, telemedicine. And uh, I periodically would have to take a doctor behind the woodshed and, um, and make sure that he or she did the right thing because we could catch it. it that never happens in a doctor's office. All right, well, we're at 159. So just to wrap things up, I want to say thank you to our amazing panelists for your time and your insights. We've definitely learned a lot. It was fascinating to hear from the leaders in this field. And thank you, Fionn and Danielle, for an amazing job organizing our time. So thank you, everybody, for joining as well. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Wonderful weekend.